Now, the next, of course, very important question is this, this ovarian mass is not one of these things we can recognize. Do they, are, are they likely to be malignant? And so again, the performance of sonography in the hand of expert sonographers is really excellent. And what is very good is combining grayscale with color Doppler or grayscale with color and Doppler spectra. And that's really the best way to characterize these ovarian lesions. So again, in the simple rule, lesions that are very likely to be malignant, if they're solid and have vascularity, especially disorganized vascularity, or if they're cystic. So if they're cystic, you have irregular wall, thick septations, neural nodules, or papillary projections or internal echoes, and always important if you have a neural soft tissue to look at the vascularity here, and you can see that there is you know, high, low resistance flow within this vascularity, and also if you have ascites, of course, and this turned out to be an endometroid cancer. And vascularity is also important because what we're trying to do is, is uh, confirm the presence of tumor vessels. Uh, they can be peripheral or whether or in the central portion of the of the lesion. And these vessels are abnormal. They lack they tend to lack smooth muscle, they tend to have A V shunting, and so they will have this forward flowing diastole with low resistive index. Now some people use these measurements. I don't personally think they're very helpful if you just look at the lesion. You don't need the color Doppler power the Doppler spectrum to tell you this is likely to be malignant. So just look at the lesion and look at the Doppler spectrum. So this is another example of a solid mass. This patient actually presented with abdominal distension uh, because she had ascites. That was her presenting symptom. So if you have ascites in an older woman, of course, that's also a very uh, indi you know, likely indication that the ovarian mass may be malignant. And so what we're trying to detect, of course, is invasive ovarian cancer, which is represent about 25% of gynecological cancers, usually affect older women peak at 50 to 60 years of age. And it's really the fourth leading cause of cancer death in women, because unfortunately, most of the time, these are silent tumors that are diagnosed late. And we already talked about risk factor, the, the BRCA1 and BR, BRAC1 and 2, gene and Lynch syndrome. And the vast majority are surface epithelial tumors, and the most common among them is serous adenocarcinoma, but there are mucinous cancer, although many of the mucinous tumors can actually be benign. And there are also other varieties such as endometrioid cancer and clear cell cancer. This is carcinomatosis, and I think you can really detect an ultrasound if you're careful. Uh, or if the patient has implants in the spleen, as in this case, so these are subcapsular implants, and of course, you can see ornamental caking very easily on CT. Now, what about this case? So this is a 26-year-old woman, and she has a mass that looked like the cystic mass, but there is a big nodule here. And again, she's young, right? So if you see a mass like this in a patient who is young, one of the things to think about is that the, the, the fact that this woman could have a borderline serious tumor, and that's what she had. So these are tumors of low malignant potential, uh, and it's important to recognize because in this patient, what they did was, because she was young and she you know, to attempt to preserve fertility, they just did a right nephrectomy at the time. And then she came a few days, two years later, and now we're looking at her left ovary, and she's a very small lesion, but if you look at the lesion here, this doesn't quite look like a hemorrhagic follicle, right? It is a little bit too nodular, and it has flow within the soft tissue, right? So this turned out to be a, a, a serous tumor in the contralateral ovary. But fortunately, in between the two years, she was at least able to have one child. So again, you know, how to describe things really important in terms of management for these patients. So these are represent about 15% of ovarian epithelial neoplasms. Uh, they tend to be mucinous, but they can be serous. There's no stromal invasion. They usually affect younger women. And again, in these patients, we have to think about 
the possibility of fertility preservation to try to do maybe less aggressive surgery because the vast majority are fibro grade one, so they have a very excellent survival rate. Now, another uh, tumor is a mucinous ovarian tumor. So this is, they tend to be very, very large at presentation, as this case it was tw almost 24 centimeters. They may have internal echoes, multiple locules, and septations, little vascularity. And although you can have mucinous cystadenocarcinoma, the vast majority, about 80% of the nine. This is another example. They can look very, very complex. This was actually a young patient where we suspected ovarian torsion and laparotomy, she had no torsion, but she had a benign mucinous ovarian tumor. However, of course, this is a mimicker of this lesion. This, is, this patient had bilateral ovarian lesions. They look kind of like a mucinous tumor, but this was metastatic mucinous colon cancer. Uh, so ovarian metastasis represent about 10% of malignant ovarian masses. Uh, the primal, common primary tumors are colorectal, stomach, pancreas, breast, and lung cancer. Uh, the clinical history is key, of course, and this patient had not only this bilateral uh, ovarian lesion, but she also had a echogenic mass in the liver. Now, to finish, I want to talk about ovarian mass that do not fit the previous pattern, right? So they're not clearly benign, they're not clearly malignant. So that, what do we do? And this is where MR really plays a critical role. So this is a good example. This is a 57-year-old woman with a palpable mass, and this is what we see in the left of Nexa. Now, if you look at it, it is very hypoechoic, and there is some shadowing, right? So that's a good, it looks like a fibroid, except it's in the ovary. So that's a very good probability that this could be an ovarian fibroma, which is a benign lesion, but you want to make sure that you you uh, confirm on T1, T1 dark, just like fibroids are, um, and it's also T2 dark, and so the, the MR will confirm that this behaves, also if you do a, a diffusion and you do a contrast, that will again confirm that this is an ovarian fibroma. And so this is, ovarian fibroma is part of the ovarian sex cord stromal tumors, which are less common, uh, and they include fibroma and thicoma, granulosa cell tumor and sertoli tumors. They can be solid and hypoechoic, but they can also be large and cystic, particularly granulosa cell tumors, and again, MR increased specificity in help guide management. So this is another example of an ovarian fibroma. So hypoechoic mass with acoustic shadowing, uh, dark on T1, dark on T2, and they can have some delayed mild enhancement post contrast. And again, the surgery confirmed that this was an ovarian fibroma, but the thing is, in this particular case, we can tell the gynecologist it's likely to be an ovarian fibroma, and they may like to do laparoscopy, not do an open laparotomy, um, but a less invasive surgery. So this is an interesting case. This is a 62-year-old woman with had a history of prostatism and high serum testosterone. And so if you look at her right ovary, she has a very small lesion, but it's very vascular at the edge with this you know, low resistance flow. And what this turned out to be at surgery was a benign sertolylidic tumor, which is the most common virilizing ovarian tumor. So what is the value of color to summarize? Well, I think it's really sometimes helpful, not just in, in showing the tumor vessels or very high resistive flow in benign lesion, but in differentiating cystic from solid mass. If you look at just the gray scale between this fibrothicoma and the endometrioma, they don't look that much different. But if you, if you see the uh, color here, you can see that there is flow within the lesion. So this is not going to be a cystic lesion. This has to be solid. Versus here, there's only flow at the edge. So I think this is how I think sometimes that color is really helpful in, in these kind of difficult borderline cases. And finally, are we always right? Well, this was an 88-year-old woman who had a CT scan first for abdominal pain, and they saw this kind of progressive-looking lesion in the right of the next cell, enhancing REM. Um, and so, you know, they thought it was an ovarian mass. And on ultrasound, the ultrasound was really not much better than the CT. Do you see the same, like a cystic and solid mass? 
And again, we thought that was an um, ovarian cancer, most likely. But fortunately for her, it turned out to be an appendiceal abscess, which had ruptured with focal perforation. And perhaps we could have picked up on the ultrasound that there was a loop of bowel intimate related to this. Anyway, it was lucky for her. So in summary, I hope I've shown you that it's really important to offer a specific diagnosis when you can not just say this is a mass and it could be anything. What we need to tell the clinician is that it's an ovarian mass, something we can readily diagnose and it's a very common thing, or is it likely benign or could be an ovarian um, invasive ovarian malignancy because they're really critical management implications. For indeterminate mass, I would recommend an MR. If you suspected an ovarian cancer on ultrasound, they can go directly for CT for staging. Also, whether the patient should be referred to a gynecological oncologist, if you're suspecting it's a ovarian cancer, whether you can do laparoscopy versus laparotomy. So if it's a, you think it's a fibroma, laparoscopy is probably okay. If you think it's an ovarian cancer, obviously the patient will, go, will need to be referred to a tertiary center to undergo laparotomy. And also think about possibility of preserving fertility in younger women. So our role is really to help tailor management to the individual women, and that's what we need to put in our report.